Hi there, welcome everybody and um, thank you for joining us for this ATMG International webinar today. My name is Mark Constable, I'll be your host and moderator for the session and it's a pleasure to be joined by Melanie Franklin who's a regular presenter for us on, on our webinars. Um, so that said, uh, I'm sure some of you on the, on the session today will be familiar with Mel but for, for the benefit of those that aren't, uh, Melanie is an expert in all things agile P, uh, projects and program management and change management. Uh, so you're really in really good hands for this session, uh, during which Melanie, Melanie will be talking about um, creating change agent networks, uh, so how you create them and how you optimise them. Um, before Melanie gets into detail though, I'll cover a few little bits of housekeeping. So the first thing to note is we are recording the session and everyone that's registered will receive a follow-up email from, from us uh, probably at some point tomorrow once we've got the recording up on our YouTube channel, so do look out for the follow-up email. Um, secondly, you're welcome to submit questions at any stage throughout the session. I'll be keeping a close eye on those uh, and we'll try to address as many of those as we can. And I think Melinda will, will, will tell us a bit more about some additional interaction that she wants from you. So, uh, so do use the question or the chat function on your control panel. Um, and last but not least, feedback is very welcome. So always welcome feedback on the webinars uh, for uh, ideas for how we can improve. Um, and you'll have my email address from the from the registration and the and also the reminders and the uh, follow up emails. Uh, so that's about it for me. But we've got some polls coming up straight away, haven't we, Mel? So, but I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I do want to make this interactive. I've already had some questions in LinkedIn when I posted about doing this webinar, so I'm going to try and answer those um, and interact with you that way. But please, um, if there's particularly when I do the slide after the polls, I'm going to be talking about the kind of the agenda, what we're going to do in this next sort of 55 minutes. Um, and if there's something on there that you particularly want to know about, or if there's something that you think oh, that's not covered, you know, just ask. Um, those of you who know me know that I'm quite happy to pull out um, examples and techniques and things that might be helpful in answer to any question, even if I haven't prepared material on it. Um, I'm asking Mark to do um, a number of questions. There's four questions. Um, so it just gives me a sense of what you're up to at the moment and therefore maybe what your interest might be. So over to you, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so first one should be on the screen for everybody. Uh, so they're all, they're all yes or no questions, not nice, simple polls. Uh, so the first one, have you been a participant of a change agent network? I, I, have you ever been a change agent involved in one of the networks we're talking about setting up? Always good quite to check empathy, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> Got quite a split there. It's, it's just edging towards 50-50. Yeah. Oh, is now it 50-50? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> okay, in that area anyway. Okay, right. Let's find out the next one, which is, um, okay, uh, how many of you are actually managing it? How are you managing a, um, a change agent network? Bit few more no's on this. Oh no, no, it's evening up, evening up. <laughs> it's like a game. Yeah, so this one this one's closer to 60% no. Okay, so 40% of you are managing one. Okay. That's after I finished with you, that <laughs> that'll even go down even lower. Um, because the rest of you are going, no, I don't want to do this. Um, what about those of you who are in the middle of trying to form one, get one set up? So that one's live now. encouraging so far more yeses and noes oh okay so we've got 40 percent of you actually managing one at the moment and the others have come on because you actually want to form one yeah so this one yeah much 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 more in the favor of yes so 69 percent yes at the moment okay so seven out of ten of you actually want to uh so a good 50 of you on this webinar right now are going to be forming a change agent network right okay so let's ask the final question and this will be the one about affecting whether or not you're successful um it's about your sponsor yeah so does, does your sponsor know what a change agent network is just why your aunt's answering the poll by the way if you do hear noises i do have 12 and a half stone of saint bernard at my feet um his sister is out in the garden patrolling as we speak and the door's open so when she finds something really interesting she will bark like crazy and he will then join in just saying because i know it's been recorded last time everybody asked when this happened what's the dog call so i've got santos at my feet and nana is in the garden on patrol 
I'm sorry, Mark, I should have put them somewhere else. I just didn't think. <laughs> That's right. Uh, right, so quite close on this one. So 48% yes, 52% no. Okay, so only half our sponsors really understand what's going on. Okie dokes. Right, let's see if I can make the slides work and see if I can get stuff. Um, what I can't do is get rid of me, so all I can see is me. Hang on. It's not helpful. Right, there we go. Um, so I put this, when I was trying to put the agenda together, I realised, which is actually um, sent sensible in terms of the change agent network, that having some kind of linear bullet point list really didn't make any sense at all. Um, there's no one obvious starting point for how you build your network. I'm going to talk about some of the techniques that really work for me. But again, my starting point um, might be um, talking about the identity of what we expect of a change agent, or I might start more with the purpose of the, the network itself. Sometimes I am bounced into a conversation about selection criteria for the change agent network. Sometimes I've got to concentrate a lot more on where the boundaries are between a centralized coordinating function. Um, those of you who said that you might be managing the function are, are performing that um, and the actual network itself. So that was my first point when I put this together is, is just to really reiterate that there isn't some simple sort of um, step by step guide. There's a linear plan. There isn't. It will always reflect on what's happening in your organisation. And for the 50 percent of you that said that your sponsors don't really um, know what a change agent network is top left. I might have to start with the reasons and benefits for that change agent network, because if I can't make the business case, the costs associated with running a network, and there are costs, even though some people think there aren't any because we're already paying people salary. So they're thinking, oh, you know, there's, there's no cost, it's just people that already work here. But of course there are training and coaching costs. Um, there are costs of pulling people out of business as usual. Even if that is one or two hours a day, rather than it being a full-time, transfer to a change agent network but there are costs to business as usual so if i feel that the sponsor doesn't really get what it is i'm trying to set up and is under the impression that maybe i'm some kind of miracle worker and even though there's twelve and a half thousand people in one case involved in the change that i i can somehow sort of engage all of them in the change um then i'm going to have to have that conversation with my sponsor first of all so do have to think about your circumstances as I'm going through this and have to think about well, what works, you know, what makes sense. Hopefully this will give you some ideas, by the way, in the chat function and Mark will call stuff out. He's happy to interrupt me at any time. If there are things in there where you think, what about this or what about that? I've already had one question, as I said, in LinkedIn, which was about should the change agent network deal with an individual change or multiple changes? So we'll deal with that as we go through. but. Meanwhile, if there's anything on here you think mm, might want to know more, put it in the chat. My starting point on the left is around, well, let's be clear then what we're talking about on a change agent network is that it is actually a, a team. Uh, another word I might use is a community. The key thing here, though, and the definition of team, it's that it's individuals who interact interdependently. So they are working together, whereas a group, people do interact with each other, but there's not that interdependence of if I do this, then somebody else has got to do that. Or if they do that, I'll have to do this. And we're trying to make that interdependence work because we've got a common objective. And we're going to have a look at the, the purpose and what it is we're, we're dealing with in a moment. But it is recognising that, therefore, if they're a team, teams need looking after. They don't just sort of form. It's, 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 yes, it's a volunteer network often, but it still needs some kind of management. And again, that's an argument I need to make with my sponsor because it's going to impact the budget. Left unattended, it will not be an effective network, would be my argument. The next thing I thought I would talk about, um, because it will hopefully help you think about how to use some of the stuff from this webinar, is that. I'm always trying to build out the network. The whole point of the network is that what it does is it takes the change to the people 
who are colleagues of my change agents. So that change agent is trying to take the change to the people in their sphere of influence. And what I'm hoping they'll do all the time is build it out layer after layer after layer. Now, accepting that fairly obvious point, what I'm always thinking about is whatever I do when I'm first establishing the change agent network, when I'm forming it, is I always remember that I'm only ever going to form maybe layers one and two maximum, and it should be a living organism, and that then the next layer down takes it to their sphere of influence, and people within that will then volunteer, and they will then take it to their sphere of influence. So when it comes to being the centralised sort of change function and whatever form that takes, I can only go so far with a network. And if I've done it well, then it will pick up that momentum. And one of the things I think about doing it well is that I'm always role modelling the things that I do to build the network. I want to enable people to be able to do that for themselves. I kind of knew that the dog was going to take over. So, for example, we're going to look at the first activity that I do, and I run this a lot with my groups. And it is something that is so simple and it's so intuitive, and they can all co create it that if I'm doing it with level one or level two, level three, they can then take it through to level three or four or five. So, that's my general principle is that whatever I'm doing, I want to make it practical. I want to enable people to use what I've got and repeat it for themselves, because what I'm trying to role model is this networking capability. So here's my first piece of, of guidance, if you like, that at the end of the day, what I'm trying to achieve is an identity for my change agents. Now, somebody else asked me in LinkedIn, What's the title of a change agent? What should they be called? Change agent, change champion? And I think the thing is, you, you've got to find a title, first of all, that reflects what's right for your culture. Um, the word champion in certain organisations is something they absolutely get behind. Equally, you might have ambassador. Some people prefer change agents. It makes them feel like 007. But other people think, oh, no, that, that's far too corporate. That's far too structured. We don't like that. So there is something about, again, this is all very culturally specific, but it's worth giving people a title that they don't mind introducing themselves as. Because remember, a lot of this is going to be socialization and communication. So title has got to come from somewhere. And what I find really helpful, and these little images probably don't do it justice, is that I think when I'm trying to get people to talk about what's involved in being a change agent, I want to find a metaphor that perhaps helps them discuss the responsibilities and discuss them almost in abstract. That's why the metaphor is so helpful, because it helps them describe sort of in abstract the sorts of things they might be doing before they get sort of stressed about actually taking their colleagues through a particular change. I'll give you some examples. Um, one of my friends uses um, a, sort of a head of marketing as the metaphor for being a change agent, because what he strongly believes is that change agents are there to market and to advertise the benefits of the change, the explaining the impacts of the change and why those are all going to be so positive and so wonderful for colleagues. I've got another friend who goes almost the other way, less corporate, and talks about change agents being the host of a fantastic party because it's all about the community building skills. It's all about, if you like, hosting events, making sure that people turn up to events, making sure that people have had a fantastic experience of the event. So using that and then getting people to talk about what being that party host would actually mean to them, I think is really important. The one that really works for me though, is personally, I find is tour guide, because I think it brings in some additional skills that I find really useful. Let me just walk you through this because I think it gives you an idea of how to run the session 
because you can do this as a workshop and it is all about co-creation. So how you can do the session for people that you are bringing into your network. So if you think about what a, a tour guide actually is, so we'll have a brainstorming session and we'll talk about a tour guide, probably got some kind of flag, moving people through um, some beautiful city scape somewhere and trying to get people on and off the coach. Uh, maybe, the, the you know, it's even worse. There's another constraint, which is not only have I got to get them on and off the coach and get through the tour on time, but also they've come from a cruise ship. So I've got to get them back to the cruise ship on time before the cruise ship actually sails. So first of all, we talk about, you know, who is our audience and how I've got to do some of the logistics around organising things. That gets everybody talking. Um, and the most recent time I, I ran this, it got everybody talking about how many people you get on a coach, because they weren't joking. They were talking about, well, how many people are you acting, actually expecting me to sort of, you know, engage in the change? Surely, you know, there's 52 seats on a sort of standard tour bus. Surely that's the absolute maximum. So I thought that was a brilliant question because it wasn't talking about their specific organization, but it was posing the right question and everybody could fling in their own answers. And it was just a great discussion about how they did it. And some people said, I don't mind being a tour guide, but I think as I'm new to this, I think I would only lead the tour of a very small mini bus. And I thought, well, there we go. That's really interesting. And somebody else piped up and then started talking about the big red bus company and how actually lots of different languages need to be spoken and it's got to be translated. And that was her way of discussing a global change and how she felt so under pressure that she had colleagues who she never physically met, but they were all part of her work group and they were all in different offices at different times and needed different things. So. You know, these metaphors enable you to sort of take things out of the actual what your situation. I mean, another thing that I use when we talk about tour guides is I talk about, well, surely you need to know the route then because you've got to take people on a journey. You need to know where the stopping off points are. And at each stopping off point, you face a choice. It might be that you yourself, with your expert knowledge, and give them enough of the tour. You can point out who lived in this building, when they lived in it, you know, or maybe you're going to a museum or perhaps you're taking your party to a restaurant when you actually want to call on the, the skills of perhaps a museum curator who's got a deeper level of knowledge in this particular subject. So now you need to think, I don't have to do every session myself, but some I do need to do. Do I know the experts that maybe can help with some of this? Do I know a restaurateur who can maybe talk about local produce? Um, yeah, maybe I do, but are they willing to do it? Have they got the time to do it? How can I engage with them? Oh, hang on. Maybe that's something I can talk to the sort of central coordinating function about. So find a metaphor, as I said, I've given you three, party host, marketing director or tour guide. Um, anything that you think, oh, yeah, that will help bring the subject alive. I'll just stop for a moment and just see whether or not anybody likes that or anybody's got any questions about that kind of thing, about identity building and thinking about the title that maybe will work within your culture. Any comments that I need to know about? Mark. Yeah, good time, Emel. I was just seeing if that was a good time to uh, to fit in a few audience inputs. Um, I, I think the, the uh, well, there's a couple that are on the same sort of question, but I think you kind of answered it because it's in a name, really. But the difference between change agents and change champions networks. I must admit, I um I wrote a paper for um a global head of transformation who I I think when I reflect on it was maybe he was over engineering it, but what he did was he he wanted us to talk about having um, different levels of responsibility. And uh, basically you had change agent at the top, then you had change champion, and then at the bottom you had change ambassador. And they each came with different responsibilities. So a change agent had um, 
farm and as an agent of change. Uh, they were supposed to do a lot more role modeling. Um, they were supposed to do a lot of the workshops around creating new ways of working. Um, they were there to liaise with um, learning and development and organize the training. Then he um, wanted us to have um, the, the slightly less involved role was change champion. The emphasis uh, he was putting on there was the word champion, and he wanted people in that role, and we'll pick this up again in selection criteria, um, he wanted people in that role who were very much uh, sort of almost a marketeer bit. They, they were happy to champion, talk positively. Um, they were known for being engaging and charismatic, and they could take an audience with them. And then the ambassadors of change were this sort of, again, a much more informal level, had a lot less responsibility. But he felt then in his big global network that by giving people that opportunity to almost have that title or that badge alongside um, their normal day to day job, they were taking on a little bit of responsibility for the ambassadorial sort of just making sure that everybody was sort of starting to work in the new way and sort of encouraging colleagues, you know, to actually get on board with it. Um, and it, it was that sort of maybe almost a structural leverage there of actually appointing people into that ambassadorial role in every team. It, it's almost like who, who is your first aider? Um, or who is the person in your building who has to evac evacuate everybody in a, uh, if there's a fire, the fire marshal kind of role. Um, I don't know if that helps, but I, I look back now and think, gosh, um, I can see where he was coming from. Um, I think the ambassador bit worked really quite well because it made a lot of people um, at, at the lower levels of, of sort of authority in the organization feel quite special. So I think that was sort of that emotional leverage as well. That was good. But the whole thing between change agent, change champion, I, I think actually became more of a source of conflict and um, almost who's stepping on whose toes um, than anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, people like the, the tour guide, tour guide metaphor. Yeah, I love it. It works. It's just so funny. Um, and it, it, uh, there was somebody who got really, really stressed, um, and uh, when we talked about. Um, if you had to get your tour party back to um, the cruise ship before it sailed off uh, for its next port and she was very it, it was a great way to have her sort of really um, talk about the fact that she was most challenged by how am I ever going to get people to sort of workshops and events when they've already got so much going on business as usual and oh they're all running late in my organization and and she just was able to vent and then everybody could pile in with suggestions and ideas so <laughs> It's it's just a nice way of people expressing their perspectives and their concern. I, I love the session because we always learn something from it. Yeah. So I, I always do in these webinars the things that work for me. <laughs> um, can it, can an SME fit in a change agent role? And I'm assuming that's subject matter expert. Right, I'm gonna come to selection criteria in just a moment. So what I wanted to say is if you are running this session, um, off the back of it, what you want is clearly some kind of team charter. We are talking about a team having a common objective, but we probably all know that a common obje objective is not enough. You also have to have some commonality about ways of working, um, maybe an agreement about how we take decisions or how we share information. Um, I was listening to um, one of my neuroscience lectures the other day and they were making the point about um, synchronous and asynchronous work um, and when you when you do need to synchronize that's important and having those actually having those times structured in the diary and when you want people to work asynchronously but when they've got something they need to work on the point they were making we all know this but again it was being really hammered home was don't forget that that if people are distracted and they quoted a statistic about your average line manager gets 27 minutes to think before they're interrupted and i was thinking wow 27 minutes sounds a long time um, in my experience um, but they were talking about how you need to encourage people in the network to block out time to be performing this role which clearly means that we're going to have to talk to their managers and that takes me all the way back to I need to win the argument with the sponsor because we do need people released for this even if it's an hour or two hours a day they need to block it out 
because they'll need thinking time um they'll they'll need preparation time and if they're distracted all the time then the productivity of that is is going to go out the window so the team charter off the back of the metaphor if it's tour guide then that's good um off the back of that then you want to be talking about what the purpose of the team is and the identity or persona enables you to bounce back through that and therefore what's the scope of the team and we're going to look at that again in a little while as well um, and then you can start to talk about the structure the relationship the coordinating function and a relationship with other project roles um, we mustn't forget that you know the change might well be off the back of a particular tangible change this morning I was doing one which is all about the rollout of salesforce.com which I'm, I know probably several of you are also doing um, so that project team that project team and the client I was talking to is working in a very waterfall way um, so how do we interact with them and then actual the responsibilities um, relationships with other team members and work stream boundaries which I'm, I'm going to look at in a little while but whatever sort of thing you want to put up about information sharing, decision making, um, whatever your team charter. Um, and there's a team canvas that you can use online. There's lots of different forms for this. But the main thing is that whatever sort of session you've had um, in terms of creating identity, it should lead you to, OK, so exactly who's doing what, how we're we doing stuff. So that would be a good one. So just don't forget the team charter. I think it's kind of important. Um, when it comes to can subject matter experts be um, uh, an effective change agent? Now, this is one I use. This is not necessarily the one you want to use. But the thing is, you've got to get the axes of this matrix right. Um, and it's often I could easily do something simple, which is subject matter expert versus early adopter. And obviously somebody who's a, an early adopter and a subject matter expert sort of makes them a really good um, change agent. Well, no, in my opinion, it doesn't because it's both of those things plus. And I, I know that it's not always acceptable because when we talk about um, being more diverse, people don't like to think that some people are good at things and some people aren't good at things. Um, we want to be far more equitable these days. But to be honest, we do have to be aware that some people have the kind of personality where you would genuinely follow their lead. And there are other people where that isn't the case. Um, I always think of my own office, actually. There are some people who have um, charisma. Um, they tend to follow through on things. They do what they said they were going to do. So there's an element there of trust. You get the feeling that they, when they, when you ask them something, they consider it. Um, they make decisions based on their values rather than just their emotions on the day. Um, they show commitment. Um, as I said, they turn up when they said they would, they follow through, they get the work done. Um, but they also have that sort of, you know, that feeling of, yeah, I'd follow them. They make a lot of sense. Um, they're kind, they're considerate. There's all sorts of reasons why we want to follow people. But there is that some people have that personality type and others don't. So this is how I use my chart, which is a clearly the top right. That's the ideal. But I'm a pragmatist. And what tends to happen in terms of selection criteria is that I will try desperately to follow a volunteer model. For that to work, I need to have got first the sponsor on side and then I need to have spoken to uh, senior and middle managers who are going to be releasing their staff to the network. I need that hurdle to have been cleared first. And if they don't buy into what we're trying to achieve, then um, people can volunteer, but they won't actually be allowed to do the role. So I've definitely got to clear the sort of somewhat practical hurdles of will you genuinely give staff the time to take part in this before I go to the volunteers? Because if you ask somebody, do you want to volunteer for something? And they do. And then their line manager is absolutely cold on the idea. Then you've already caused a problem there. So we want to avoid that. But if I am going down the volunteer route, I, I'll have my ideal change agents. But a lot of the time, sometimes it's 50 50, um, sometimes it's 80 20. But there will be certain people who are kind of nominated. 
um, I ran a big network a couple of years ago where um, some of the middle managers were honest enough with me um, to say that they had volunteered some of their staff because they felt that it was a way of getting that staff member out of their hair and giving them a break. <laughs> and I thought, great. So you've given me people that maybe don't have the kind of personality that you would want to follow, but you're giving them to me to build into a network. That doesn't seem really fair, does it? Anyway, when that kind of thing happens, it's recognizing that maybe I've got somebody with lots of expertise and real knowledge about how the change is going to affect business processes. And maybe personality wise, they genuinely are in favor of the change. They're up for change. They think change is a sensible answer. But they don't have that ability to get people to participate. I, I can still use them, but I'm very careful that what I use them for is almost like a sense check rather than trying to whip up enthusiasm. On the flip side, bottom right, sometimes I get given people that or people who volunteer and when it will be politically suicidal to reject them. Um, perhaps what I'm getting there is they've got all the personality in the world. And they are, they, you know, they, they're engaging and they, they love community building, but actually their technical knowledge, so their subject matter expertise is, is very weak. Um, they can motivate, they can infuse, they can actually be great at creating the right atmosphere, but you can't use them for, okay, but what's all the impact of this change and what are the knock-on effects and how is how are we going to actually make that work? So I think you know, there are some people who really you, you, they haven't got the personality and they haven't got the expertise and we just need to knock them out of the equation. But I can't just rely on the top right. I'm going to have top left and bottom right also involved. Does that help with um, the questions? If there's anything in the chat that anybody wants to come back on for that one, let me know. I think... Um, I was just thinking about when I could answer the question about multiple changes. So I think I'll get on to that one now. It's already half, more than half halfway through. OK, Mark, nothing in the chat that I need to answer. Does that give the person who wanted to know about subject matter expertise the answer they wanted? Thumbs up emoji if you were. <laughs> uh, yeah, no specific reaction uh, to that. Yeah. OK, one's um, got bored and gone home. That's OK. Um, now, when it comes to the purpose of the network, I think a lot of us involved in change, it's so obvious that what we are asking people to do is to lead themselves and their colleagues through the transition. Now, whether you happen to be on the top right there, a, a sort of a Kubler-Ross kind of person and talking about all the emotions, maybe you like the competency model, maybe you follow a bit of Lewin down there, unfreezing and changing and refreeze. You might be a Cotter kind of person with his eight steps. You might be Fisher with all of his dreadfully depressing emotions there on the right-hand side. You might be an Adcar person. But I think this is my hobby horse because it's the one that causes me the biggest issues is that there is an sort of underlying assumption that people know what these emotions are and they know therefore how to lead people through this. In the last 10 days, I have worked with three change agent networks specifically. One is people who have been trained in change management. Um, and the other two are volunteer networks that are just and they're all just getting started. And it didn't seem to matter whether the people had been trained in change management. I didn't train them um, or whether or not they were just volunteers. None of them had a real confidence about how people react to change. This effectively, you see, is the journey. You know, when we come to the purpose of the network is we've got two things we need to worry about. The outcome, and you really want to be picking that up in that identity session, in the metaphor, you know, what's a good outcome? And you get people talking about, well, everybody's had a fantastic tour or people have learned something or they're able to go away and do something they couldn't do before. Like they went to a restaurant and they learned how to, um, I don't know, peel prawns. You know, it's have they learned something? They're able to do something. Have they been fascinated by something? Have you encouraged them? You've got to talk about what that outcome looks like. And in organisational change, that's usually, you know, they're working in a new way. And then you've got to talk about the journey that they're going to get there. 
And I think what we have to think about is that that maybe is not as obvious as everybody thinks it is. So I think for me, it's talking through that and providing as much sort of skill and technique work as I possibly can. So when we talk about sort of how a centralized change function might actually be useful, and we found this for the, for the sessions I run for the continuous change community around the world, this has been a perennial discussion point, is that if we are change professionals, it is part of our job now to go out and build the capability in all of those change agents, all of those people from the business participating in the change. And a lot of what I think we have to do in terms of transferring our capability is practical problem solving techniques, sharing experiences of how people might react to change and what you do when somebody resists and why they might be resisting. So I think there's an awful lot we have to do about transferring our capability to make this a reality. In, from my own experience, I tend to use um, this simple model. It's the one I put in the Agile Change Management Handbook. Um, it's the one that's in the Agile Change Agent and Change Coach courses. And, and it's, it's very simple that I'm, I'm gonna take people through interest you know getting their attention getting their awareness before i try to sell something to them and get them on board so positivity and the benefits of the change will come after i've i've got them aware how important it is and why we're doing it and then of course the big thing is getting them participating in it but that's going to be supported by the resilience the ability to keep going and i think building that emotional resilience is important and hopefully we'll then get to the enjoyment, the realisation of benefits. What I do is I say, actually, I'm role modelling in building the network with you guys, whoever my, you know, first and second layers are, perhaps. I take them through the fact that in order to get to the point we're now having this conversation, you are now in participation. I'm, I've taken you through interest. I've got you wanting to be a change agent and now here we are working out how we're actually going to perform that role so I sort of say to them look you know I'm role modeling this for you so we spend a lot of time talking about you know why don't people want to be aware of the change we, we, we've sent loads of messages out we've held town halls we've done webinars why is the message not landing so we talk about the practicalities of getting people aware and interested we talk about how to get people on board to buy in and really want the change. And we talk about intrinsic motivation, that kind of thing. And then we talk about how do you get people participating in the change, self-choice, autonomy based on different activities for different learning styles, different personality preferences. And, and just by showing them I'm role modeling, you've I've been taking you through this and now you're a change agent. So you're actually going to be taking people that you bring on through this cycle. So let's look at all the activities we've been through together so that you can replicate those activities as you build out your network. So it goes back to that principle of earlier on how in building your own network, don't forget that you're role modeling how your change agents will build out the network in their area of the business. What I think is really important in doing this, and this is years of learning that I'm pulling out here, is that um, we need to be careful that it, it does help to make sure that there is some kind of sort of teaching about maybe how people generally react to change and talking about the emotional and the psychological impacts. But what's been far more impactful for me in the last few years is actually saying to people, do you know what? There are a whole load of neuro hacks. There are, let's think about how people's brains are wired. Let's think about therefore why they're reacting to change the way they are, why they're resisting the change, why they're not getting involved. And let me give you an entire toolkit of things. Let me talk about the most common pushbacks you're going to experience from a team a line manager not wanting to talk to her team about the change because she doesn't feel she's got full information yet to the team sort of seeming on board with the change 
nothing actually happening because actually they're so busy with business as usual and they haven't really got into the benefits. Understanding how their brains are reacting to change and, and maybe giving them some sort of quite surgical tools to get in there and get that motivation, that persuasion skills going. That, that's become my life's work really, because what I'm trying to do is democratize the ability to lead people through change. And you can only do that if you give people tools, the techniques, practical solutions, really, that we know as change experts actually work. Let's start transferring that knowledge. If you're in any doubt about that, join me for a couple of days on the, the change coach course and you'll find I've got like 41 neuro hacks just in that course of things you can use. It makes such a difference. So practical. And it's actually, it just makes you smile because you know you've helped people solve a genuine problem. And I think if you can explain the purpose of the job is taking people through this transition curve. And by the way, here's a toolkit. I, I think that's when you get actually a, a network that hasn't just been designed and formed. It's actually operating and it's making a difference. What scares me is when we've got people who volunteer um, and they volunteer on the basis that they've got subject matter expertise of, of current processes and they kind of appreciate why we're changing. They think the change is a good idea. They understand the technicalities of what will change. These processes will be streamlined. We'll not be using that system anymore. They understand how people's jobs might change. That's only half of it. They haven't got the toolkit of the, the sort of the persuasion techniques that will actually get people to change. So they kind of know it technically, theoretically, but they might not have the techniques, the subject matter expertise of change, not just the subject matter expertise of what is changing, if you see what I mean. So that is something that I think we need to address. And that brings me to something else that I find really important to do. And it is about boundaries of authority and what's really expected of the role. And with my sort of transition curve there at the top from the existing to new ways of working, what I focus in on with my change agent network, and it, it's different for every organization because it very much depends on whether or not there is a centralized change management team that's got a change framework and it's got a toolkit and things. Often those toolkits, by the way, are all about templates of pieces of paper people we need to fill in and not the kind of neuro hacks that are the real practical stuff. But anyway, if you've got a big centralized team, that's going to have an effect on what your change agent network does versus what that centralized team does. Maybe you're looking to build a network because you happen to be the one person in the big program who knows anything about change management. There's only one of you and you're really struggling to get that done. And so you desperately need a network and you can't do that much centrally for them. Maybe the program manager has actually decided to bring in um, some colleagues for you and they are change experts and they can do a lot more. And everything in between, you know, one extreme to the other. But there are these work streams. I think there is something about, we need to be an information source about the change. So we need to explain what's, what's gonna change, what's remaining the same, why we're changing, what the impact is. I think there's, there's a lot in our role. By the way, I used information source and not communications because I, I do worry that too often people think that all we do in change is communicate. Um, there's training to organize. Sometimes it's quite technical training. Sometimes it's training of just showing people we've reworked how we do stuff around here. Let's take you through it. Um, and that comes off the back of the fact that we probably run quite a few workshops on process definition, uh, process re-engineering really, um, off the back of whatever the tangible change is that's triggered all of this. And there's also coaching. What I want the change agent network and if I'm the coordinating function, I want us to talk about, I've got to get this right at the upper levels, level layers two and three maybe, because if we don't get this, the boundaries right, then the bottom layers as they build out, will get it wrong as well. And what I mean is that let's take information source. 
there'll be some things that I think come from the centre like when we're starting on the change there are going to be big corporate announcements that either come from the the, the transformation director the program manager maybe the corporate communications function but it's all the big picture stuff it's probably quite broad brushstroke it's um not that interactive but off the back of that what we are kind of expecting the change agents to do is give a local flavor to it um, to put it into that local context and and in quite a persuasive way they we then kind of bounce back because that we are then looking for again some centralized information that's coming out much more about the reasons the benefits and again we need to take that into a localized view and then back to maybe more centralized benefits if we're still struggling to get that message across you could draw this picture related to to where do you think your centralized sort of coordinating function what do you think that's going to do for you versus what do you think the change agents should do for themselves I work with one global change network um, that what that covers is it covers, if you're a member of the change agent network, you're covering all changes that are coming out across the organization. Um, and what you've got is a very, very well resourced central function that almost provides a complete sort of um, uh, change in a box kind of thing where you get sent all of the materials you get sent workshop agendas and activities and games to run uh, you get sent loads of stuff and actually therefore the, the the responsibilities for working out how to do stuff is not that great on the change agents because they're so busy actually doing it um and then, then i work with others maybe the change a the change agent network is just for one program um, and there's a lot of local autonomy and, and frankly, not much coming out from the centre. The disadvantage of that is that what you find is that you've got change agents all over the place actually having to sit down and devise their own presentations, for example. Um, and they're all sitting there writing presentations when, frankly, I've got 30 change agents writing the same, effectively the same presentation. I could have given them a central version of it and then they could have tailored it. So there is something in here about you know economies of scale getting these boundaries right is not just about what how much am i prepared to shovel on the shoulders of my change agents i've got to ask do they have the skills for that and i've got to ask is that also an efficient way of operating when it comes to coaching i need to think about the fact that yeah my local change agents probably do some great sessions on hearing you know people venting their anger about the change people sharing some of their ideas so um having one-to-one -one meetings where they can hear people's concerns and maybe following that up with further discussion and for some that's more than enough to get them on board with the change but for others who are really saying these are all the reasons why the change shouldn't happen they're really going for it in terms of almost sabotaging the change then there has to be a, an agreement that that is outside of the sort of um the coaching that maybe my change agents can provide maybe i need access to real expert hr professionals perhaps or career coaches and again, you can see the, the boxes in teal here, that the responsibility to the coordinating function. We need to think about who's resourcing that, um, particularly when it comes to things like the coaching. Again, something very similar for process definition. We might have some uh, almost uh, initial workshops for how this might affect work, but then we want access to the experts to give us an understanding of how will that work in practice and what about this? Um, and then it might be that we also turn to the to the coordinating function because getting the sign off from compliance and audit and quality management is way outside the pay grade of your change agents um, and that's something that's got to be done on behalf of the entire change so there's another boundary and then training again you know demonstrations might um, come from the centralized sort of function about how things are actually going to work in practice um, but then some of the core training and some activity specific modules might be done locally by the change agents, but then there's got to be an opportunity to feedback really quite detailed and maybe specific and complex and technical questions um, to somewhere in the, the more centralized function. So again, I think this has a big impact on 
thinking about how this is going to run when it comes to do you have one change agent network for every change of course the advantages for that are that it can be very specific to the change um, and people can therefore maintain their business as usual role um, because they're not spending that much time on the role but if you're looking at this kind of set of work streams and sets of responsibilities um, and you're supposed to be doing this for multiple changes genuinely have, have you got the time to to also do a business as usual role um, or would that put you under too much pressure but if we take that away from you and we kind of second you into the change agent network then do you become quite divorced for how things are being done and therefore your subject matter expertise starts to become stale and less relevant i'm thinking here particularly of a um a local authority in the uk that got themselves into a real mess over this that people were seconded for a two-year secondment to this change agent network and and they very much were the marketeers of the change but he really did notice in the second year that um, they had less influence over their colleagues because they weren't colleagues anymore. And they hadn't actually had much interaction with these people other than being seen as the person who promotes the change. And by the second year, their subject matter expertise was getting weak, but so were their network connections. So I think, you know, those are the sorts of things that we really need to be thinking about. How's this gonna work in practice? There's no one answer. Um, and as I come to the sort of the question part of this, there's no one answer. But hopefully I've given you a flavour of some of the things I think about. And it probably gives you a clue about why um, I came up with that agenda, which had so many items on it that were inter interrelated with each other. I'm going to turn to Mark and see if he's got any questions in the chat. Anybody want to put something in? because um, we're coming towards the end of the time, but I'm very happy to answer questions. Brilliant stuff, thanks Mel. Um, certainly I've got some questions and I'll apologise in advance because I don't think we'll get to all of them in the hour, um, but I'll start with this one, it's a good one. Uh, when setting up a change agent network, should we be using a different approach in an agile change environment compared to waterfall? No, I don't think so. I think for me, the big difference is that when we're in an agile environment, we are implementing waves of change. So the first thing that's different is that for a particular initiative, I'm probably going to quadruple, quintuplet the amount of change uh, because we're putting people through that transition curve, aren't we, after every iteration or increment. Um, so I think we we are creating more waves of change. Um, I think the second thing is, though, that there's a, that we have to maybe support change agents a little bit more because the pushback they're going to get is the fact that what people are being given to get to implement and start using is not fully formed. So there's an obvious seam of resistance. Well, you haven't given me all the functionality. Oh, it's coming in version two. You know, it's those are the kinds of arguments. So I think knowing what those arguments are likely to be, um, I think we can prepare change agents for that. But I don't think the structure has to be any different. Okay, thanks. Mark. Um, how do you manage this situation? This is going back to the quadrants uh, diagram when uh, picking the members. Um, how do you manage a situation where anyone high high on this uh, quad diagram is likely to be in high demand? Yeah, now that is where you can sometimes find that perhaps for those people, maybe there, there is a role where they are covering more than one change because they do have um, particularly the, the personality and perhaps the communication skills to be able to give what I, something I think is really important, which is a holistic, a cohesive picture of how all the changes interact with each other. And if you've got somebody who's at the high end of that personality ability and people are willing to listen, then I think that there's that sort of extra responsibility that you can give them. So it's not everyone's going to be like that, but I think you can ask people to play much more of a role. So it's almost like they're a change agent plus, you know, they're the real, you know, extra group. And, and you'd really like to sort of be working across multiple initiatives with that. If you find somebody and they say, I'd love to help, but I'm already really quite involved in these changes, you can say, all I'm asking of you actually is that when you're 
doing some of your other change agent work, um, you actually in you know you uh, explain to people how some of these other changes are interrelated, and and that's worked really well for me actually um, because they are then a force for for good. I'm sure you will agree to this one, but do you agree that change agent network also plays a very two way communication role? Uh, bringing back bringing back to the project or change manager the feedback they're getting from people on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it's that comes back to that relationship with the central function, whatever that central function is. One of the things we've got to set up is how do we get information back to two sources? I think um, one is um, back to the people responsible for the tangible change. Um, and the other one is how do we get um, their feedback back to the people who are sort of commissioning change overall because an awful lot of the time the feedback is the change itself is fine but we're just overloaded um we've got too many changes happening at once um, and the other key message that will always come back is um yeah we could make these changes but we're so overloaded with business as usual we can't see the wood for the trees so i think what we i think what we can do as change professionals is we can have two very clear sort of tracks back one is this is all the sort of technical questions about how the, maybe the tangible change works. There's the feedback about whether it's working in practice or not. And here's another one, which is much more about feedback around totality of impact and the practicality of that. And that's going to a different audience because that's got to go to senior leaders who can actually say, ah, our, 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 our staff are telling us they're overloaded. So I think two different tracks. <laughs> Uh, how long have we got? We've got a few minutes. Uh, so have you or, the have you or uh, a member of the team set up a change agent network that moves from programme to programme? How and what are the considerations and implications? Um, this is coming back to whether or not they can manage um, more than one change. I think it comes back to the issue about the fact that if you have got that sort of mobile force, you've got to remember that as they move to the second and then to the third, um, they are becoming more and more divorced from what made them a great change agent in the first place, which is here, that they have that local expertise of how the business currently works. And therefore, they can appreciate how the change will reshape the business. The longer somebody is pulled away from that, that day job, that can become a problem. Um, so that would be my, my caveat. The other one that I've seen as a, as a real problem is that, of course, there is a churn rate. Um, and what happens is that um, people are uh, taken off for different jobs. So um, we, we've still got to keep refreshing the network anyway. So I, I think you need to think about that. And the third bit is um, how does that actually affect their remuneration? If they have a contract for a specific technical job at the moment, whatever that job is in the business, and they've got uh, performance metrics around how they perform in that job and they're spending more and more time in the change agent role one of the things that routinely is done badly is that nobody's thought hang on a minute how are we remunerating them for the change agent role alongside their BAU role great stuff and one, one final question uh, what, and I guess this would be subject to the nature of the change I guess uh, but what's the life cycle of a, of a change agent network how long after go live well, uh, again, it very much depends on um, if let's say we're doing a, an agile change, um, that agile change might be taking a place over a 12 to 18 months, wave after wave of change. What I really want from somebody um, is if I can just go to sort of here, what I really want from somebody is that they're kind of going to stick through um, this transition. Um, and within participation, what might be happening is they're wave after wave of change. Um, and I, I really would like them to, to stick through to the end. So that's for me, the life, the life expectancy um, when they come on. And it's something worth talking about in terms of when you have the identity and when you have the team charter is that you, you don't want somebody who's volunteering and then, but actually they're gonna be um, applying for a different job within the organization. They're never gonna tell you if they're applying for a different job outside the organization. Um, but if they're applying for a different job within the organization, um, they're having some kind of professional change, you, you kind of don't wanna invest in them and then they disappear off. So worth considering. 
Hey, great stuff. I think that takes us towards the end, towards our hour. Uh, so let us start wrapping up there. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I hope you found it uh, useful and informative, I'm sure you have. Um, and thanks for taking part in the polls and submitting questions throughout. It's a really great engagement. So thanks for that. Um, there's, a, there's a few links on screen there that you can see. And the obvious one for me to point out, point out is the Agile Change Agent course. Uh, and certification that we offer. So it's a great way to, to upskill in this area. And Mel, do you want to say a few things about that, given you're the, uh, the lead architect? Um, yeah, I'm the chief examiner for both the Agile Change Agent and the Agile Change Coach course. It's great that you put the Agile Change Agent up there. Um, uh, I think what that gives you is some good planning skills. I talked about the Agile Change Coach, which is being a lot more about the neuro hacks um that you can learn um i think the thing to also say is that i've written up everything that i've said plus a lot more um in a document that i'm going to send out to mark so he can um uh, give that to you as, as part of your recording pack and i'll get that up on my website as well but um i never send out just the slides because i think gosh that's pointless um in abstract but i have written all of this up um, i was getting up at five o'clock every morning this week to do that so um you will have that available and we're going to have to end now because I'm going to have to feed those dogs. It seems <laughs> we got, just got away with a few barks, didn't we? Because it did all right. You should see what they're doing out in the garden right now. Trust me, um, I need to go and feed them. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, thanks very much. Well, thanks again, everyone. And uh, enjoy the rest of the, the week and the weekend ahead. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.